So, good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing this afternoon? <coughs> Thank you. So, we continue on with our discussion of object oriented programming. Last class, we covered instance variables. We saw how you can collect up a bunch of variables, stick them inside a class, and not do anything else with them. And that's still somewhat useful. Now, we are going to add the second bit, which is when I, uh, when I ask you to stop talking, it means stop talking, please, you two. Second to last row, please. You're distracting everybody else, including me. So, We're going to talk about methods. Methods are, of course, functions in the Python sense. The only difference is we are now collecting up a category of them, which all apply to the same data. Maybe I'll just wait until people have found their seats. In future, it would be useful if everybody was on time for the class. So, <clears throat> thank you. Remember our fundamental abstraction, the purpose of object oriented in the first place. The purpose is to be able to package data with the operations that operate on that data. So, these are the operations. You will notice some differences with how you declare methods in Python versus in Java. The first and foremost, the def keyword is removed and replaced with a firm data type. Does anybody care to guess what the purpose of this data type is? What does it refer to? Yes? The return, where are we returning? Yes. We are describing the return type of this method. In Python, it's very loose with what it returns from a, from a function. In fact, uh, perhaps you didn't know this, in Python you can even have different return types under different circumstances. Um, you can even return multiple things from a, a function, although that's kind of in Python, that's frowned on. Well, yeah, in Python, it's frowned on. Plus, it's like what they're actually doing is like kind of collecting it up as a tuple and then disambiguating the tuple afterwards. So it's like it's it's it says it supports multiple return pieces of return data, but it's like mm. the star mm. so. In Java, all statements except variable declarations must be inside a method, and all methods must be inside of a class. So this is in contrast to Python. In Python, you had the statements that were inside of functions, and then you just had regular statements hanging out in the middle of nowhere. In Java, everything is very strictly and rigidly defined. We have our statement, regular statements inside of methods, and all of our methods must be inside of a class. And please, 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 one class per file. Thank you. So, we've already given some attention to the main method, but it's useful, it's important, so it's useful to review it again. When you execute, a Java class, execution begins at the top of the main method. If the class does not contain a main method, it is not executable. As the, uh, like the Java virtual machine has no idea where to start executing the program, because there's no main method. So, another 
interesting little piece, which actually, you, you might think this is out of the way, but you, you, you will end up using it quite frequently. Void. Void methods. So the void keyword may be used in place of a data type when specifying the return type of a method. This means that the method returns nothing. Or it just doesn't return any data back. You are still able to use the return statement. You're still able to use the return keyword inside of the method. You just don't pass it anything. It's just return hanging out there in the middle of, you know, or at the end usually. And that is fine. You may be asking yourself, well, what is even the point of a, of a function or a method that doesn't return anything? That's supposed to be the output. Very often, the reason we use void methods is the purpose of the method is modifying the instance variables of the class. Um, this falls into a loose set of methods which we call setters. Um, we're going to study a few different... Um, uh, methods can be put in a few different categories. Um, you have setters, the purpose of which is to set information inside of the class. You have getters, the purpose of which is to retrieve information from inside of the class and return it. Um, you also have various uh, overloadings of essential functions like two string conversion and equals. And then you have your miscellaneous category, which are your general operations. We'll see uh, examples of all of these. <coughs> Any questions so far? Good. So. When you call methods, uh, arguments are matched to parameters by position. Uh, this should not come as a surprise, as this is how it was working in Python. Um, there is no, uh, there are no optional parameters in Java, as you found in Python and in JavaScript. Um, when Java, when you enter parameters in Java. You are matching exactly the function prototypes or the method prototypes. Uh, one for one, there's not a great deal of fiddling with it or fudging, the num uh, fudging things around. If you want to call a method with different, uh, with different inputs or a different arrangement of inputs, you must create a specific definition for that in Java. That's how the language prefers to think of itself. So, The way that we think about functions changes when we enter the object-oriented paradigm. Under procedural programming, that is to say, Python and most of the way that you're going to be using JavaScript, to be honest, and most of the way that you're going to be using PHP for sure, when you hit server-side, in procedural programming, functions are a specified subtask that you wish to repeat several times, that's the purpose of encapsulating it in a function. Arguments provide all information necessary to provide uh, to perform a subtask. In theory, if you're not over-relying on global variables, and return values communicate the results of the subtask. In object-oriented programming, we think differently about methods. Methods are an implementation of a specific behavior of an object. These, uh, the behavior is related to values in instance variables. Arguments provide new information not already in the object's instance variables. That is to say, all methods have all instance variables accessible. 
there is no need to pass information into the class that's already there. When we think about methods, we are thinking about the interface to the class, not as an interface to a function. So, when we see an argument to a method, we are not thinking about passing data into one method, we are thinking about passing data into an object. Right? We're thinking holistically about the object and the class when we are defining our method interfaces. Return values in an object-oriented sense, the purpose of them is to get information back out of the object. Right? So this is why when we have setters, the purpose of the setter is to set information in the instance variables, they will have arguments but no return value. When we talk about getters, they will have return values but no arguments a lot of the time. The purpose of the getter is to retrieve the information, the information already in there. Does that make sense? So far so good? Any questions? Okay. So, let us consider our circle class from last class. So, first let's discuss the UML diagram. These first two sections, we dealt with those last class. This bottom section is now new. Now, I must warn you that there is slightly inconsistent uh, conventions for this if you compare this document to uh, some of the other documentation uh, located in Canvas. In fact, uh, I'll bring it up right now. If you look under resources, UML class diagram style guide. Woohoo. There we go. Under section one, basic class diagrams, week three and four, you will see this is how class diagrams are expected to be laid out. with methods. The same as with instance variables, they may be private or public. This is indicated by a plus for public and a minus for private, respectively. We provide the name of the method followed by round braces even if no arguments are provided. In programming, the way that you distinguish a function or a method from a variable is by the presence of those round braces most of the time. Except in certain circumstances that we won't get into. If the function method, if the method has a return type, this is indicated with a colon and a type occurring after the round braces. So this is where we indicate the return type. In actual Java code, this guy goes in front, but here it goes afterwards. Secondly, our argument names and their types are provided as a comma-separated list inside of the round braces. So, uh, here, here are your, like, here's the TLDR. Is it private or public? Provide the name. Provide argument names and types paired. Provide return type. From this information, it is possible to perfectly and completely reconstruct the, the method header in Java. 
All of the information in the header is contained in this, uh, in this uh, class diagram. Some of you may wonder what the underlying means. I think I mentioned the class class. Does anybody know? Does anybody remember? Static. Static numbers are underlined. But we haven't talked about static yet, so don't worry about it too much. Okie dokie. Any questions? I will be marking you on your adherence to this style value. That being said, sometimes in the notes, the variable names are left out and just the types for the uh, just the types are provided. I consider that to be an option for how to do these. So if you want to leave the variable names out, I won't take marks off for it, basically. So that would mean you, you would just have a comma separated list of the types alone. Does that make sense? So, so let's consider the four methods. Uh, yeah, you can see that it's even been inconsistently done within this very diagram. Graphics context is a type. That's a class, um, and no uh, variable name was provided. So, you know, and eh, what are you going to do? Anyway. So let's consider the first one here, get area. We are talking about a circle. So what is the formula for an area, the area of a circle? It's pi r squared, which in this case is interpreted as math.pi times radius times radius. Because that's actually faster than using the math library's ex exponent function for just squaring something. So that's a faster implementation. But anyway. You can see, we're not using private or public yet. Um, we haven't talked about encapsulation. It's less of an issue with methods than it is with variables. So, in a general sense, when you make something public in a class, what does it mean? Anybody? Any, any idea? Uh, it can be viewed from other classes. Yes? Um, it can be pulled directly out of the object without using a method. Yes, it can be, it can be accessed directly from the, uh, the object's super object or parent object. Private means the opposite of that. It's restricted so that things outside of the class, outside of the object, cannot access that information. There are very good and reasonable way, uh, uses of this when it applies to variables. With methods, though, if you make a method private, what you're basically saying is no method outside this class should be able to use this method. That means that the method no longer forms part of the class's API. It removes it from anybody being able to call it from the exterior. So, what's the purpose? Why would you do that? Because, like, there is a use case, right? Uh, if you don't have a get method for it, it can't be accessed. Um, you're thinking about variables. Hmm. One reason you might want to make a, a method private is if it's a helper method. Our rig, like that regular reason that we wrote functions in the first place. It's a series of instructions that you're repeating often that you want to package up inside of a function, throw it in there, but it kind of does internal stuff and you don't necessarily want people knowing it exists or messing with it, right? In that case, you make your method private. But overwhelmingly most of the time, uh, we're going to be basically dealing with almost exclusively public methods in this class. So uh, it doesn't come up very much that you would have a private method. Um, so yeah, 
Any questions about that? Yes. So by default, in these cases, uh, are these variables and methods uh, public or private? So if you don't specify which, I believe it defaults to a third state called protected, which is somewhere between the two. But basically, as soon as we talk about encapsulation, you will never see an instance variable or a method without private or public specified for the rest of the course. So this is a very temporary state of affairs. That makes sense. So just hold on to your horses. We're going to talk about encapsulation today. So aside from that, hopefully you can all see the correspondence between a Python function that would calculate the area of a circle and this Java method that does the same. You know, aside from these kinds of class-specific details. The actual implementation of the method itself is something you've already studied. So what we're talking about here is code organization, right? Inside of these things, you are permitted to use your full and complete range of if statements, various types of loops, various types of data structures, local variables, everything you want. Print, well, there's no sister. Hmm? There's no sister though. Yeah, uh, not, uh, well, it depends, right? If the class you're working on is, the, uh, is an inter you know, a user interface class, by all means use print statements. But if it's not, if it's an internal model class, don't use print statements. Make sense? So let's examine this guy for a moment. This is a set. This is a set method. Now, with setters, you, you will most often see them set one variable at a time. In this case, we are setting a location. X and Y are coordinates, so it makes sense to set both of them at once. right? But literally all it's doing, we have two inputs, new X and new Y. They are assigned to x and y, and that's the end of it. It's a void, it's a void method. It returns nothing. They exit automatically when they reach the end of themselves, so you don't even have to put the return in. Does that make sense? It, uh, question? Is there a benefit of putting the having the set method and then putting that to the top? Sorry, is there a benefit to having a set method? Uh, yes, a so set method like this rather than putting that in the mean. Oh, um, this is going to become much more interesting once we start talking about encapsulation. Like right now, there's no real reason to do this over just saying, you know, circle, uh, circle object c, c dot x equals 5, c dot y equals 7. There's no real advantage yet. But as soon as we get to encapsulation, we're going to make those variables private, which means that we can no longer access them directly. Um, and you might be saying, OK, so you know, why would we not want to access them directly? That seems very convenient. If we use a setter, we can put code in here to protect the variables against invalid values. So you all recall, I hope, the, uh, the Arkanoid assignment that you guys just wrote, right? In that assignment, you had things like, you know, paddle position must be, be, must be between this value and that value. You used an if statement to protect that value from becoming invalid. Right? There is basically the design idea behind object oriented is things should protect themselves. It shouldn't be the responsibility of the, uh, the programmer using the class to run a bunch of checks to make sure the class is going to work. The class itself should be responsible for protecting its own data. And this helps, like this helps 
abstraction and encapsulation, and it makes it much nicer to program with all of these things. Basically, like the design idea of programming, you never want to call a function in a library and have to write a bunch of code in order to do so. You should just be able to call the function, right? Um, and that's what this is for, right? If you can imagine this being paddle position, right? You could work in an if statement here that indicates uh, or only writes the value in if the value is valid. And if you prevent someone from accessing the value any other way, that is protected data. Does that make sense? So that's where we're going with all of this. Uh, it's defensive programming. <clears throat> so, this is the sort of example that you're going to see. Um, there, there's a fair amount of this sort of thing, so it's, it's good to sort of dwell on it for a moment. So, we have a draw method. The purpose of the draw method is to receive a graphics context and call the JavaFX methods necessary to draw the figure on that, um, on that context. This draw method <laughs> is not responsible for creating the graphics context. Right? It's not creating it, it's merely receiving a reference to an already existing graphics context. So you would call this from within your start method inside of the, inside of the, the FX template. Does that make sense? Sort of? We'll see lots of examples of it. This is another interesting one. So, you remember the, uh, the controversy we had over the use of uh, the equality operator double equals over strings, right? That if you do that, it's not actually comparing the contents of the string, but the memory address of those two strings, right? We used a dot equals method instead. Well, it turns out that that's actually the default behavior for all objects. If you use the double equal sign on any two Java objects, it compares them to see if they are stored at the same memory location. It's not just strings, it does that for everything. So. If you want a definition for equality, you must provide one. You are responsible for telling Java what it means for two circles to be equal. In the case of circles, yeah, or geometric figures, more generally, if they are stored at the same location, or if they're located at the same location, and they are of the same size, they're the same, even if they're not, <laughs> right? They're equivalent to each other, even if they are two different um, objects, right? So that's how we that's how we define equality for many uh, like that. That pattern is quite common. If, however, I wanted a different. Um, a different condition for equality there is well within my right to do so. It's like it's well within my ability to change this depending on the conditions of the uh, the objects, right? So, for example, if the circle had a fourth instance variable indicating what color the circle was, for example, perhaps we don't care if two circles are different colors, so long as they are located at the same place and they're the same size, right? Well, in that case, we would just leave color out of this, uh, this equality comparison, right? If, for example, I don't know why you'd want this, but if you did, um, if a circle is located at the same, like, 
y level, but you know the x value can change. You can leave this term out and redefine equality that way. So the definition of equality here is very flexible. You have the ability to put in something that makes sense for the particular task you're working on. Uh, but that also means that you know you are actually responsible for defining it yourself. Question? Uh, what is equality to another? Ah, good question. So the equals method expects a reference to another circle object. In the same way that we grab a reference to a graphics context by typing the argument as graphics context, we receive a reference to another circle2 class. This is circle2, right? If you notice at the top of this, um, This was defined as public class circle 2, so as to not overlap with the circle 1 definition earlier. So circle 2 here is a reference to a different circle object. right? So the way that the equality method works, then, is if I have circle to A and circle to B, I say A dot equals B. That's like, that's how you, that's how you use this, right? A circle object has been passed in as a parameter of the equals method. The other one that it's comparing to is the um, it's the instance it's the object on which the method uh, is being called, right? So this is the method of, or this is the object on which the method is being called. This is the one this object wishes to compare itself to, right? Um, we kind of like we're used to thinking of equality as kind of you don't think of equality in this sense as like C is comparing itself to D, right? You just say C and B are being compared. But when it comes to methods, you think A is comparing itself to B, right? Whenever it's a method, it's the object that's performing the method, right? The object performs the action. Does that make sense? Question? So the uh, other is comparing to circle two. Um, yes. Uh, so no, no. Uh, other is a circle two. Right? They're equals. Yeah. So if A and B are both circle objects, if I call A dot equals B, then. Um, yeah, it's, it's the B, uh, circle 2 is just the type of B. So with methods, you must indicate the type as well as the, variable, the, the argument name. So that's what that is. That's the type. We use classes as types. Yeah. Um, when you are defining a class, it is actually reasonably correct to think of yourself as defining a custom data type. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, anywhere you use int, or double, or float, or rule, you can insert um, a class name, and now you're dealing with an object reference to an object of that class. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? These are good questions. Okay. So. Let us turn to our exercises. You guys remember me telling you that you needed to keep your code from last time? Yep. Good. Well, some of you didn't. Perhaps some of you perhaps didn't. It's OK. Um, honestly, the code from last time should take you very little time to put back together again if you lost it. Instance methods. Consider the various behaviors 
behaviors that the objects described in part one might engage in. Recall that behavior represents something the object can do, or something that can be done to the object. Some ideas are given below. Add methods to the UML diagram you drew from part one. Consider names, parameter types, and return types carefully. Whichever class you are working on, you should include a dot equals method as well. Then implement the methods and add code to your main method to test them. So this should take you a little bit longer. So if you decided to go with the bank account, example operations are deposit and withdraw money. Should you be able to deposit a negative amount of money? No. There you go. Get interest for the current month, whatever. With squares, you can get area and perimeter. You can draw the monographic context, etc., etc. Televisions can be turned on and off. You can change channels. You can adjust the volume. Students can get their combined grades for each category, get final grade, show a report card, etc., etc. And for a video game player object, a video game player could take damage, heal, move, display themselves, etc. So, please take your examples from last class, add some methods to them, and uh, we will take probably about 15 minutes to do this. Afterwards, I will show you an example that I will work up. I suppose I could turn the lights out, eh? Okay. Better? Or worse? Oh my god, so worse. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, let's go. 
Honestly, with the big windows, it's, it's still yeah. pretty good in here. Can't we change the class? This is so depressing. Yeah, this classroom is like so depressing. It feels sleepy in this class. <laughs> the other classroom is smaller, but it's at least better. Yeah. Well, except for like the U-shaped layout, it's so hard to get like yeah. for me to yeah, walk around. Yeah, the layout of the class, the size but of still, the class. But still, but that is not so but depressing. But it's not depressing. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have the willpower to study in that class. In this class, the willpower just dies. Even in morning, 8 o'clock, we don't feel depressed like we are today. Yeah, 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 really. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it's it's Canada, so welcome to institutional cinder block as far as the eye can see, eh? Yeah, it's, yeah, oh my gosh. It's, it's just something about being in a, in a basement, you know? Yeah. Even though it's like, I don't know if you could even really call it that much of a basement, you know? But, but still, it's a, ba a basement is a basement. A basement is a basement, yeah. This used to be a textiles, um, uh, yeah, like a class, but this is what I, what I was hearing was, um, they used to have like, looms and things in this room, but I guess they don't teach that here anymore, so. I'm a class leader for Python, and the first class they gave me uh, for this session was this one, and I was like, I hate this classroom. This is my Java classroom. This was actually, this class. Yeah, this was actually the first classroom I ever taught in at this, at this place. Oh. Yeah, so uh, I was teaching Memories. tech writing. Oh. Yeah. Which? Our computer, uh, tech is online, so... Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> I'm glad I'm not teaching tech writing anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know you love Java. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to be teaching math. That's, you teach math as well? This is math. Oh. This is math. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. couple of examples, we'll be building the same class up with more and more teachers.
was going to need the light. That's where it was falling over. Polymorphism, like five minutes on polymorphism. I'm going to do mine on the board right now, from scratch. So first, what's the first step, implementation or design? So we're supposed to do what first? The UML diagram, yes. I'm going to do the video game one because I'm a nerd. So, recall that the box that he wants is under the UML tag. We will want the one with class name, fields, and methods. I'm going to call this one RPG Player. So, what sort of data should we associate with an RPG player? Well, how about a name? Uh, name will be a string. We also have, for example, a class. I know it's like, well, I probably won't actually be able to call it that in Java, because that's a reserved keyword. But, um, Profession? Yes! Job. How about job? And how did you add a second line? I'll show you by doing it again. See this one, uh, item attribute? You click and drag that into the box at the appropriate location, and that adds it. 
If you press enter, you won't get what you want. You're welcome. So, hit points will be an int. Um, Attack will be an int. And defense will be an int. So far, so good. Let's do an implementation of this in Java. So, to create this new class, I right-click New Java Class. We called it RPG Player. There we go. I had several instance variables. String name and job. Oh, oh, did you know you could do that? Int HP, attack, and defense. Do we have to make a new one? Uh, is it to open the circle one? Um, the circle example that we did in class is, um, that's different. Uh, you were supposed to make a new class, yes. Oh, all right. Question? Um, is it fine that the variables start with a capital letter? Yep. Yes, it won't cause any issues, but if you want, I can change them. What? <laughs> it's just like, you know, in, in a video game, they would be capitalized, you know? Yeah. I but know. it's okay. Um, yeah. um, so now, our object is to... To, uh, to create one or more RPG characters from a main class. So, create new Java class, call it main, <coughs> type the word main, press tab, that gets you public static void main. Can you split the screen so we can see the other one too? Most assuredly. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Can you give it uh, any name, or does it have to be the main class? Uh, which, the, uh, the main class? Yes. Oh, main is the name of the main class. It's oh. kind of conventional to call the top level class that you intend to execute main. Oh, okay. It doesn't have to be called main. I could have called it like RPG world or something. But um, that's just kind of conventional. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, good. So, let us create some RPG player objects. RPG player, um, P1. No, I want, I want to, uh, it's like, uh, what do I want to call them? Steve equals new RPG player. And RPG player um, um, Gwen equals new RPG player. There we go. We have successfully created two RPG player objects named Steve and Gwen. Now, we need to insert some data into these. So, steve.name is equal to steve. Gwen.name is equal to Gwen. Yeah. However you spell that. Is it really going to spell check me? Let's see here. Yes, yo. Gwen Dolan. There we go.
What should Steve's character class be? Mage. Thief. Well, mage and thief. So, mage thief. Ooh, you're slipping right. yeah. Yep. Oh yeah, we're we're doing we're doing uh, uh, multi-classing already. And then Gwen dot job equals he must be an elf. An elf? He must be ah, an elf. old school, where elf and dwarf used to be character classes. I like it. There we go. Um what's the business with elves being able to class as paladins? Elves are elves! That's already a class. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> you can continue on in this manner. You know, if you wanted to say Steve dot HP is equal to you know eighty um, Gwen dot defense is equal to five because she's an elf. Um, that kind of thing. You know, I think you guys get the point, right? We can also print all of this information by, by the same method, by the same uh, means. So, by mm -hmm. said s out um, steve.name, and then when, we keep going for the queue, when.name, there we go. Now, I just need to set this as the file that I'm running, run name.name, .name. there we go, bing, bang, boom. And it's taking a while. Last time I did this, restarting IntelliJ fixed it, so I'm gonna do that. So far? Yes. So far, so basic? Alright. So far, so last class. Now, let us insert some methods. So, number one, what's a thing that can happen to an RPG player? They can die. They can die. Ooh. Nasty. Maybe. Before death, though, what usually happens first? Yes, we can take damage. So, um, so if I were to write a method for the RPG player class, which remove like damages the player in RPG terms, that means we are reducing the hit points, right? I'm a, I guess I'm assuming that most people in our class will have like a basic familiarity with video games with this example, but uh, if you don't, go play Dragon Quest. Moving on. So, um, so if I, so for that, you're not really modifying anything outside. You're not. It, it's not necessary to return any information at this point to outside of the class. Harm. We then provide an amount of damage. HP minus equals damage. And that's as easy as it gets. Now, perhaps we did want to report to the rest of the program. Give me a give me a um, whether or not this harm, this amount of damage was fatal, right? It's useful to report back to the calling class some details about the operation. So, for example, we can make it so that this method returns a boolean. True if it was fatal, 
false if not. To do that, we would change this to an integer. Or, sorry, to a Boolean. What am I thinking? There we go. If... Oh, uh, one interesting thing, though, before we get there. You see the little red underline there? Missing return statement. As soon as you change the return type to non-void, it now expects a return statement. Otherwise, it's not a valid method. So, if hp is less than or equal to zero, we return true, as the damage was fatal. Otherwise, we return false, as the character survived the attack. Does this make sense? Did you have a question? Uh, what, is, uh, what does hp and death mean? Ah, um, so these are, these are video game terms. Um, hp means hit points. Uh, video game characters basically keep a number that keeps track of how healthy they are. When they take damage, you take uh, an amount off of that. If they reach zero, they die. Um, attack is just attack power. It's like an attack score. It's how much damage you do to enemies when attacking. Defense is a defense score. It's how much you reduce incoming attacks by before taking the uh, taking damage off of your hit points. So really, if I wanted to do this properly, it would be damage minus defense, and then you take that off of the hit points. Right? You know, if I was doing a more full simulation. Does that make sense? You can also do additional, um, additional uh, checks and other sorts of methods. I don't want to dwell on this too long, as we've got lots and lots to get to today. But one thing that was a requirement, we need to take a look at dot equals and write an equals method. So, what does an equality comparison operation return? It returns a boolean, that's right. So, boolean equals. We will take another RPG character as our input. Now, when we use this equals method, we don't know who it's going to be called on, either like we don't know if Steve will be comparing himself to Gwen or Gwen will be comparing them herself to Steve, right? We want to leave this vague and ambiguous. We don't want to say, like, Gwen here. That's why the word other is used, right? It's like, I have me, and this is the other one. And it's the equivalent of the argument. Sorry, yeah, what? There is a parameter because of the argument, right? Yeah, well, um, well, parameters and arguments are the same thing, number one. Number two, this is the, this is the type. Right. Number three, we are, defined, we are deciding what the name of the argument should be. Um, other is conventional. It's like, we have this and we have other. When two objects are comparing themselves to each other, that's how it's normally called. So, other. There we go. We then want to compare all of the different pieces of information in here. So, return uh, this dot uh, name is equal to, oh, 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 that's a string, dot equals other dot name. And this dot uh, job dot equals other dot job and etc etc this dot attack is equal to other dot attack um, yeah we'll leave that you may notice that this is a bit tedious there's a lot of typing. 
This is a uh, this is a function. Uh, this is a class with only uh, six, five, five uh, instance variables. <coughs> Are you at all interested in seeing how you can get IntelliJ to automatically generate this method for you? The answer is yes, please. So if you press hold the Alt key and press insert. You have a generate menu. You'll notice that we have a lot of things we haven't talked about yet. Constructors, getters, setters, getters, and setters equals is in there. Don't worry about hash code. Just worry about equals. Yes. So, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. There we go. Just click through that first one. You then get the option of specifying which parameters you want to be included in this equals method. Add it in the form of checks. So, for example, perhaps I want to exclude hit points because uh, hit points are variable. Two characters might, you know, be the same but be at different points of hit points. Anyway, let's just say I want to go back. I click next, and um, it's going to generate hash code to select all non-null fields. Um, these should both not be null. There we go. Create. There we go. Good question. Yo. Can you get into that generator menu again? Alt. It, alt insert. You can also get there from the right click menu, I think. Um, yeah, generate. Right click generate or alt insert. So you can see it's doing a lot more checking as well that we're not even doing at this point. But um, yeah. Kind of neat, huh? Good. Sorry, uh, people are talking over here. Could you? So I mean, like the uh, Boolean equals the method that we have created. Is it also the public expert or the same? Um, oh, ours? Yeah, um, it should be public, yes. <laughs> um, yes. So, there are a couple of like slight differences here. Um, this Boolean, like this guy, is taking in an object, like a general object, and then comparing it to see if it is an RPG player, and then, uh, like, if it's not an RPG player, it's returning false. So, this one's a little bit more robust. You can use it on objects of different types. This one, the one we wrote, if you don't give it an RPG player object, it will flunk out on a type incompatibility error and fail to compile. So this one's a little bit more robust than ours, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, any questions? Uh, what is this? Ah, this is a special. We're we're going to get this uh, get to this when we talk about encapsulation. Um, this is a special keyword. It is a reference to the object on which the method is being called. So, for example, in our main class here. If I call, if I use steve.harm for 10 damage, right? While harm is running, this is Steve. Does that make sense? And if I were to write another one where blend.harm 
um, during the execution of that method, uh, this would be the reference to Gwent. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? How are you guys feeling about this material? Is this okay? Are we doing okay? Okay. Uh, um, oh, yes. Can you, can you go over commenting? Like, how do... Oh. Oh, are you commenting? talking about these overrides? Um, I'm sure you'll get to it, but I mean, like, how to properly document it. Oh! Good, yes. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about documentation for a moment. So, documentation which is required according to the documentation standards for the course. Number one! Lots of com comments. No, don't add, that's actually not, that's actually not preferred. Um, there is such a thing as over-commenting, um. right? The comments should always explain what the code is trying to accomplish, right? What, like, what was your intent with the code? What were you trying to do with it? The purpose of the comments is not to explain to me how Java code works or what, like, you know. For example, a comment that says this is an if statement is not useful, right? We can see that it's an if statement. We can also see that, uh, very clearly, that this if statement is checking to see if the HP is less than or equal to zero, right? If you're just taking the code and writing it out in English, that's not useful commenting, right? Your comments should be, why are we checking to see if HP is greater than zero, right? We are checking to see if HP is less than zero to send back whether or not the character died. Right? So a good comment here is something like check for character death. Right? Because that's what this if statement is doing. Something like if, you know, uh, check if HP is less than or equal to zero. First of all, it takes more space, and second of all, it's not like it's no new information. Yeah, we know. Uh, we can see that. Yeah. Basic code, we can see that. Exactly. Like um, you always have to keep in mind what your uh, who your audience is. If they're reading comments in your source code, the only people who look at source code are programmers. Yeah. Right. So, and if they like, if they're looking at the Java code. You should assume that they're either good enough at Java to be able to read it, or they're about to be fired anyway, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, back to uh, required comments. Um, so the class requires one. Class representing a player for a tabletop RPG. Author. Um, Dr. Moore. Uh, what is the keyboard shortcut for uh, editing Java, uh, Java comments? Oh, um, if you just do slash star star, it will start one for you and maintain it in IntelliJ. It's very nice. In fact, if you, um, if you do it in the right places, like for example in front of a method, <coughs> slash star star, enter, it will automatically add tags that are necessary anyways, like parameter and return. So, um, How did you do that again? Can you repeat that, please? Absolutely. All I did was hit slash, star, star, and I pressed enter. Oh. And uh, it automatically did it. Oh! The, the theme is not dark to light. I mean, just give me a second here. And it's, uh, where is it again? Settings, settings, Sorry, which one is it? Oh, the gear? Oh, yeah, that's it. Uh, settings, there. Appearance. 
Dark Hila. Okay. Everyone should always use Dark Hila because IntelliJ comment or yeah. Um, JavaDoc comments come out in green, and regular comments come out in gray. So it actually shows you if your, in, if your JavaDoc comments are formatted correctly, which is nice. Green is good. Green means go. So, um, so you describe what the method is, like what is it for, what does it do? Right? Method for doing HP damage to player. Subject to defense stat. Damage is um, amount of incoming attack damage. Return value is uh, whether uh, true if dead, false if living. That's documentation. Notice that it doesn't have to be like just forever documentation. There should not be more documentation on your page than code. Most of the time. Some of the methods get quite short. Especially when we're talking about getters and setters. But, you know. There's one more. You gotta put these in. There we go. Um, descriptions of what these things do. Now, it really works best if they're on different lines. So I was a bit too fancy for my own good. Boom, boom. The name of the player. It won't auto-complete these ones, unfortunately. The character's um, profession slash class slash job. Like that. Make sense? Good. Question? Is there a way, how do you get it to auto complete stuff? Do you have to have it in a certain position? How do you get it to auto complete what? Do you auto populate the variable? Oh, uh, yeah, you just have to have the cursor on the line before the method. Okay. So, like that. Like, if there's any space in between it, I, it won't do it. I think. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. Moving right along. I don't know what the hell happened, but my PC turned off. <laughs> Out of nowhere. Um, you were subject to an involuntary reboot. Yes. Uh, yeah. So. Which is... <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so... Topic three, encapsulation. So, <clears throat> programmers are sneaky. They're too smart for their own good. Programmers love taking advantage of little tiny exploits. It's like, you know, they love like pushing on variables and in, inserting values that are maybe probably incorrect and seeing what happens. And if it's a favorable result, they like to put stuff like that in. Like every, every in, in the soul of every programmer, there's a hacker, you know? So, encapsulation is defensive programming. You wrote the class, you know what the variables are for, you must require, pe you can require people 
to use the variables the way you want them to be used. That is the purpose of encapsulation. So, examples of the sort of mischief people can get up to. Setting variables to invalid values. Uh, again, think about the arkanoid example. What happens if I enter a negative number of rows of bricks? Right? Mm -hmm. Something break? Probably, maybe, we'll see. Did you guard it correctly? I'm going to be finding out. Changing, like putting variables in invalid ranges is like, that's like your, your very basic kind of, um, that's, that's like the basic case for why you would want to do this. So to encapsulate um, means to draw a boundary around, right? We have all of our precious little pieces of data floating around in cyberspace. Right? And we build a wall around them. Right? We build a wall around them by making them private. We then provide an interface to them. A fixed interface with a little security guard who's checking things, and there's like one of those little gates that you get, you know, that goes up and down in each one of those little guys, right? That's what a method does when you've encapsulated your data. The method allows for a fixed means of access to the data inside of the method. So, in general, these things aren't bi-directional. Methods allow data in, and different methods allow data out. These are differently called accessors and mutators, if you're being poncy, setters and getters, if you're a normal, ordinary, blue-collar programmer. So, get methods, get values out of, class, set methods, set values inside of a class. So in UML diagrams, the minus means private and the plus means public. So you can see, in this circle three example, all three of our instance variables have been made private. We have also one private method, distance, which calculates the distance from one circle to another. So, let me uh, show you how this works then. So, in our RPG player class, The way that you make an instance variable private is you put the private keyword in front of the variable. Simple. Private, private, private. Notice how I had a bunch of pop-ups, four related problems, two related problems, one related problem. If you click on those, it brings you to the problems. These have become invalid operations. Name has private access in RPG player. So we can no longer assign in this manner. We can't just go in directly. What we need are setters and getters. We will start with the basic ones.
public string get name return name. It's just that simple. yourself. This seems kind of tedious. Is there any way I could speed this up? IntelliJ will generate these things for you as well. You can generate getters and setters or both. For the time being, I'm going to do these both depths separately. Generate setters. You select the ones you want to generate. And there you have them. Now, in here, in main, rather than accessing dot name directly, we say Steve dot set name. There we go. Wait, why, what's, what's the matter? Did I misname it or something? Oh. Yes, okay. Oh, my goodness. All right. I apologize. I thought I was doing setters and I, I got my getters and my setters confused. Okay, we're going to just delete everything and make them all at once. Delete, generate, getter, and setter, all of them. Okay, boom. There we go. Get, set, get, set, get, set, get, set, get, set. Now, you can see. That set name Steve is no longer in red, and therefore no longer in error. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes. Are you generating the There are two ways. The first, hold Alt and press Insert. The other is to right-click, generate. Both will bring up the generate context menu. So here, you go through and reset all of these things. Um, Steve dot set job. There we go. One dot set job. Steve dot set a. A D when dot set fence five because she's an elf. Then when we want to print the information, we use get methods. Get name get name. We now have a working program that has no errors in it that does exactly the same thing that it did before. Any questions? So your question might be that, uh, yes? How exactly does it like uh, encapsulate in uh, uh, the fence of the rest or the fence of the world? So right now, I cannot access any of these stats directly. So, for example, I couldn't say something like steve.attack is equal to 7. I, I, that's no longer possible. I must use the methods. So, for example, we could do something like for set, set HP, it doesn't make sense that HP should be less than or equal to 0, right? So, we could say something like, if HP is less than or equal to zero, or is greater than zero, then we set the HP. Otherwise, um, don't do this on the assignment, but you can say something like, improper 
value. Right? You can do something there if, if you're given an invalid value. Right? Exactly. This if statement, which would have gone in the main class, now goes in the RPG player class, which means we only have to write it once instead of once for every object. Right? This is better programming. So, now, if, for example, I tried to call uh, when dot set HP as negative 10, just as an example, improper value, right? And, uh, the HP stat of the Gwen object never gets the bad value. That bad value is never stored. Thus, the class is protected from invalid data. Does that make sense? So that's like that's one of the real reasons to do this kind of thing. Um, plus, that protection is now built into the class itself. Somebody using the class doesn't need to know that you're performing that check because they don't need like they don't need to do it themselves. If they were like without that, that person would need to perform that check themselves, whoever's using this class. And that might not be you. Right? Now, anywhere this class travels, HP will never be invalid. Right? Defensive programming. Does this make sense? Any questions? Okay. Um, please take literally 30 seconds and generate all of these setters and getters for your examples. Then take another minute and replace all of your direct variable accesses in your main method with use of the methods, please. At this time.
for now, the override tag is not a required part of Java syntax. It doesn't have to be there for the thing to compile. What it does, it tells the compiler, hey compiler, I think I'm overriding a method right now. Would you mind checking, checking to make sure I am actually overriding a method the way I think I am right here, right now? And then the Java compiler is like, yeah, I can do that. Check, 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 check. Oh, actually, no. You're not overriding a method because you misspelled it. And that is the purpose of the override method. For example, if I were to write in my RPG player class, uh, two strings usually go at the end of the class for no particular reason. Uh, public string to string, right? If I were to make a, uh, uh, if I say override that return point, just like that, and I run it, you can see instead of that uh, instead of the thing I had before, I now get point. It has nothing to do with the contents, right? I need to you know, like, use the variables and such, but that's it in principle. Now, consider what ha happens when I misspell it. Too strong instead of too string. Ooh, look, I've got a little uh, squiggly here. Method does not override method from its superclass. You actually get an actual honest to goodness compiler error if override detects that you're not actually properly overriding the method. So, what the override tag is actually doing, it's a way for you to take Java, a language with a lot of compiler errors, and add even more compiler errors. But they are useful. Errors are useful. They tell you when you've done something wrong. When, if you think you're overriding something and you're not, your program's not going to work the way that you think it will. So the override tags actually, when you override things, it's good practice to use it, right? When you, uh, you know, when I show you in a few moments how to automatically generate a two string in the same way that we generated everything else, you'll notice that it throws it in. You'll notice that for hash code, it threw it in. It's, it's good practice to use it, but it's not strictly required. Does that make sense? So far, so good? Okay. Um, so, the way to generate a two string, alt insert, two string, select which pieces of information are relevant to be printed, Perhaps I'm not interested in attack and defense. This is what's automatically generated. If we print it, this is, this is how IntelliJ automatically generates let me see the information inside of this method, please, or inside of this object, please. Now, this is a bit like basic and default. If you wanted to uh, jazz it up a little bit, you're absolutely free to do so. Do we have to do the string for all of the uh, objects? Sometimes it will be required in assignment documents and that sort of thing. Often it won't be. In all cases, it's useful because it helps you debug. When you're using, uh, when you're using console to debug and print and like, let me see the status of various things, um, it's useful to have this method because it, it saves you work, right? Um, yeah, does that make sense? So even if it doesn't call for it, I would recommend it, you know? 
But if you want, you can do stuff like, you know, name the class name. HP out of lots. Then, if you run that, you can see it just changes the way the thing is, is out. I guess the thing I'm trying to say is, you don't have to go for the default, right? You can make it, you can massage that, make it look however it's useful for your particular application. Question? Uh, just a quick question. If we don't put the override there, would there be any, uh, or what is the range? Nope, uh, leaving out the override tag will cause no errors. Everything still happens. However, if I manage to misspell my name of my method here, it basically just, it's not used because in order for Java to know that this is what you intend as the string conversion method, it must be exactly named to string. Java can't read your mind and know that you misspelled this, right? That makes sense. And does override also detect patterns for the method that you created if the uh, name is wrong, or does it only detect error override only detect errors for for the Java English method? So this is kind of getting into a little bit of like <coughs> more advanced object oriented stuff, but I will give your your question the answer it deserves. Okay. So the way it works in Java, all objects inherit from a base class called object. That provides all classes with certain basic features. One of those basic features is this style of two-string conversion, right? So the, ob the definition of object contains a two-string method, right? When you have a derived class, oh, like change the definition of a method, that's called overriding, right? If you have the class which is being inherited from with a definition, and the class doing the inheriting changes the definition of the, of the original, that's known as overriding, right? So in order for it to in order for it to be, like, in order for the override tag to mean something, the class you're inheriting from must contain a definition for that. So, for example, get HP, there's no definition for that in object. So, we, we're not overriding anything, we're just defining it. So, the override tag there, you, you would just cause yourself problems, right? For example, Um, set defense override. You can see we get the error. Method does not override method from its superclass. Object contains no definition for uh, set defense because it doesn't have a defense stat. That's not like object contains almost nothing except for these basic definitions. Right? Does that make sense? Good. That's a little bit of inheritance. That's like, that's the direction this course will be taking after the first midterm, basically. Um, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure we don't do inheritance before the first midterm. Yeah, it's, uh, this week is OO. Next week is basically more of the same. We talk about constructors and whatnot. Um, 
After that, we have a test. After that, we talk about arrays. Then we're talking about inheritance. So, yeah. Composition is in there before the test as well. Cool. It really is getting quite dark. <laughs> That's okay. What do you mean by first midterm? Are there two midterms? Uh, yes, there are two midterms and a final exam. How many tests are there? Uh, midterms and tests are the same thing in my view. Okay. So, uh, here, well, let's, let's consult the syllabus. So, we are here in week three. Test one is in week five. In two weeks. It's pen and paper, right? It's pen and paper, yeah. The test will be held in the Friday class. So in this, at yeah. this time, um, you guys... In this depressing classroom. In this depressing classroom, in two weeks' time, uh, you will be, like, finishing the test, hopefully. <laughs> in exactly two weeks. Yes? Uh, for the tests, are we allowed to use IntelliJ? Mm, it's pen and paper. Yeah, so the computers will be off. Um, if I could, I would. Um, um, basically, um, it's difficult to keep online tests um, valid. <laughs> like in terms of keeping cheaters from having their way with an online test, it's, it's um, you know, the paper tests are considered a safer option in that respect. So um, yeah, that's, that's why. That's why paper tests, basically. Um, I'm kind of of the opinion, like just generally, as a, as a singular individual person, and this opinion is somewhat at odds with other people, other professors in the department. I think that paper tests forever, actually. Just throw out online testing completely. Paper testing is the only way to make sure that it's actually real testing. Um, but I also think that the internet is fake and everything online isn't real, so there you go. Um, you can imagine what my opinion of online classes is. <laughs> Um, Online classes are bad. They just don't teach you as well. Yeah. Just, yeah. I've always left in on online classes. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. I've done them. You know, I'm not. I don't have this opinion having never done, taught an online class. I taught all through the pandemic at, at McMaster. Yeah. I know. I know what I'm. You know. Yeah. Students are sleeping. That's. Yeah. It's. It's not as. It's not as good a quality education mm -hmm. online as it is in person, and anybody who says otherwise is stupid and wrong. I st I've studied 11 pen calls, both grades online, and trust me, I haven't learned yeah. nothing. I don't think I'm saying anything that's surprising to anyone in this room, considering we all know what happened a few years ago. The um, problem is uh, that there are, uh, you know, there are people who weren't taking or teaching classes in that period, who are nevertheless making, the deci making decisions about the classes. Um, and whether or not they should be online. But, you know, that being said, um, you know, those are my controversial opinions. Uh, they are not the opinion of the institution. I take full responsibility for my own grumpiness. Uh, yes? In your RPG class, yes. class, you define two equals methods. Which one is it using? Oh, um, it'll, use, it'll use the more specific one. Yeah, uh, normally, it, like if you did that properly, it wouldn't, it would fail to compile. But um, this is another, this is another form of polymorphism. Actually, you can define a method multiply with different type signatures. It will use whichever version matches the type of signature that it's used with. Um, so if this is called with an RPG player object, it'll go with this definition. If it's called with a general object, it'll use the first. Um, but really, I should just delete mine. <laughs> if that makes sense. So, um, if everybody could literally take 15 seconds and add the automatic two-string method 
to your classes that you're working on, that would be much appreciated. We didn't get a break today. Oh, didn't we? Oh. Um, hmm. Okay, do that and seven minute break. Go. <coughs> So, are, are all objects just inherently of a subclass of object? Like object yes. being a class? Yeah, that's what it means to be an object. Because, this might be wrong, but if you're making a subclass of a class you've already made, you have to clarify that. Unless it's the most general object, which is just object. Okay. That's taken as given. Right. And actually, you want to know the truth? Same in Python. Yeah. yeah. Python also has a general object which everything inherits from by default, including even literals. Is there like a, a compiler reason for that? Um, or is it just it'd be a lot harder to make objects if there wasn't a object which we're inheriting stuff from already? It's just kind of like, why would you want to make a class without all the basic definitions? Well, I was looking at the object class, and some of the stuff in there makes no sense to me. But it also doesn't look like it's doing much. Yes, this is object-oriented design. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to say everything they decided to do makes sense, like, from an implementation standpoint, but, like, like you've probably seen enough Java by now to know that, like, the, re the thing they designed the language with was, like, a concept of mathematical purity that is more important to them than such, you know, pedestrian concerns about, like, how long it takes someone to type something in the language, yeah. you know? Like, the re like Java's a very verbose language, but it's also a highly mathematically precise language. There's a lot less in Java that's implicit as compared to many other languages, right? So, if you want to know exactly what the program is doing, Java is a good language for that, right? Which is, that makes it useful when what you want, like, when you need to know exactly what the program is doing, like if you're trying to write anything that's reasonably optimized, right? Um, so Java is not a bad language for writing optimized code in, because you can actually control things, you know? Um, yeah. Also, are you going to go over bug testing at some point, like how to actually properly use the bug tester? You know, it's not in the not in the course curriculum. Okay. Because I tried to use it, and I'm used to like next step, but all I could find was step over and step in. I have. Can I can I can I be honest with you for a moment? I've never actually used the debugger on IntelliJ. <laughs> I've never actually used it. So. I I've used like other debuggers and they, they usually make decent sense. Mm -hmm. This one I couldn't figure out. So. Um, for advanced students such as yourself, I would say something like. You can probably figure out a way to do, a way to do this. For most people, I would probably just point them to Python Tutor. You know, because they really I, I feel like it's really helpful to have that additional visualization element, particularly once the classes like the class structures get start getting complicated. This is this is peanuts compared to what we're going to be doing later in the class. Yeah, I, I've already looked up how to do like custom folding because I know like all those set variables, I just want to fold them so I don't look at them. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to be doing that, but I'm worried that you're going to look at it and go, he doesn't have any set variables because they're all folded up. Oh, oh. <laughs> you want to know, you want to know something about the way that I'm going to, and the way that I'm going to grade your assignment. I'm not even going to use it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm compiling them from the command line, man. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that way I can script it. Fix everybody's oh. stupid misnamed uh, file names. And lovely, lovely. Mm. Excellent, excellent, excellent command line scripting. Like, oh. I just, I, I love Bash. I, just, I, I love Bash scripting. I, it's my goal to, like, to write Bash scripts to automate the get grading process for every course I teach. That's, like, my, that's my life goal, you know? Is, okay, which one's better, Bash or PowerShell? Well, Bash is on Linux, and Linux is better than Windows, so there's your answer. I've been told that they've recently started overlapping which one can be used on which system. Well, Windows now has the Windows subsystem for Linux, so you can presumably do Bash scripting through that. I'm, I'm sure there's ways of doing PowerShell on Linux, but like on Linux, why would you, like, I don't know. Maybe PowerShell brings features to Linux that you know Linux didn't already have. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to doubt it because Linux is so much superior in every possible respect. I. I know very little about, like, that is like text-based programming, mm -hmm. and I took a class on it and failed it because oh. I didn't like it. Mm. So I, it's part of my networking, I'm going to learn it there, so I'll, I'll get a, gris, gra, a grip on it eventually, yeah. but right now it's very limited on what I know about it. Yeah. Um, are you doing more um, more courses in, in this stream? Like, are you going to do PHP? Maybe on PHP. I'm taking this class specifically so I can take a .NET class. Oh, oh yeah. Hmm. Because I've been told that that's very useful in terms of servers. I mean, yeah, it's... I've also been told it's being phased out, but so... Well, server, server programming is a little interesting. It's a bit of a wild west because, like, literally any language can be used. Yeah, my but, Java script teacher was telling us that Java uses a, a, a system and then Java script started using a system for their servers and databases. And mm -hmm. They can use it for all three so that they're trying to, like, cycle out of those. And it's just, yeah, it looks like the wild west because mm -hmm. there's Java script for front end. And then server, you can like use Python, Java, PHP, yeah. C hashtag. They all have their own C things. Hashtag. I guess yeah, C sharp. It's it's a it's crunchy C. It's it's Microsoft Java. Um, so if I was to make a recommendation to you for like a course to take in the programming stream, if you're interested in learning server programming, server side programming. Take the server-side programming course. Like, even if it's teaching the wrong language, it's like, what that course, like, I taught that course last semester. What that course has in it is like, you know, sure, you're learning PHP, but it's also about, like, how do you not get hacked? You know? How do you handle incoming packets? You know, how do you set up a, re a REST API? Like, you could, it doesn't really matter what language you implement it in. But like it's the underlying principles that are important, and that course has uh, a, a great deal to do with those underlying principles as well. It's not it's not a language course in the same way that this is a language course. Uh, you know, we're not in that course. You're not being taught just PHP, right? You're being taught servers. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Which like not server admin, but server programming. Yeah, because with networking, they're very clear. It's like, this is outside. You're dealing with the network. Once it goes into like the server space, you don't worry about it. That's not your job, yeah. Yeah, so I like I, I do want to know what's happening in the server. Because like, I'm going for sort of a DevOps job. Ha, yes. Which means that knowing both sides of the fence is mm -hmm. going to be useful to me. No, no bloody kidding, yeah. Um, in that case, I would I would highly recommend taking the server side, and maybe even you get to take it with me. Who knows? I know they're running it in the summer too. If you're up for summer courses, 
But uh, nah. I, I, I'm going to have to work full time because, you know, money. Uh, fair enough. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you can only take so many courses. But, you know, the fact that you're here in this classroom learning Java when you don't have to be, it's like... I, from the sound of it, I, I, I think that I think uh, server side would be more useful to you than than C sh than than .NET. Um, is server side term three or term four? It's term three. Three, okay. Yeah. So I'll probably take it next term then. Um, and like the feedback that I get from the students a lot fr about C sharp, uh, the the .NET classes, it's basically a lot more of this type of stuff, mm. right? It's like it's like a like a deep dive on C sharp type course at the moment. So, um, if servers are what you're interested in, I would recommend the server course. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank awesome. you. Um, <clears throat> and I will stand by that advice. <laughs> All right. Just, just a quick question. Okay. Um, oh, calculate them in the student class. Yeah. Well, you have to redo it for every student in the main class. If you do it in the student class, you do it once for everybody. Yeah. Like, your general design idea should be try to push everything down into the subclass as much as you can. Right? To the very like, least at the least, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Sound good? Yeah. I think I got it. I got it. Sure. We got to keep motoring. Oh. I'll take a look at the class. Um, oh, there's okay. also pass right after class. What? Sorry? There's a pass thing right after class. But like immediately after class? Yes. Yeah, I need you. Why on earth did they do that at 4 o'clock on a Friday? Because they're done. It, it's the time they were given. It's also online, the last I checked, for yeah. today. See previous comments. <laughs> okay, folks. Let's learn some things. So. Interface versus implementation. This is um, this is more of a conceptual topic. There's not so much like actual code to go with this one. So once we're done this, we can uh, we can return to our um, to our examples we've been working on. By the way, keep them for next week, please. Next week we're going to be discussing things like constructors. Um, basically, you still only have about you know half the story. Uh, with respect to basic object-oriented constructs, but so hmm? do we know enough to do the assignment two? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know enough to do assignment two, but there, are, you know, it's it's been designed that way. But um, constructors are very useful. <laughs> so uh, I will like if you use constructors on assignment two, that will help. But it's not necessary to use them. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, it's kind of like another one of those things. If you already know everything about Java programming, you can do. We can whip, crack off those assignments very quickly. You know, sort of thing. Um, the better you get. Hopefully, by the end of this class or at the end of this course, you'll look back on the first couple of assignments and you'll be like, Ah, that was child's play. Look at me now. <laughs> so. Um, so, the difference between interface and implementation. So, B 
the interface to a class is all of the public instance variables combined with the public method headers combined with javadoc comments. This is what it is reasonable for someone to look at when they're trying to use your code. What's more interesting is what's not included here. It is not reasonable for someone to look at your public, or sorry, pardon me, your private instance variables when trying to use your program. The stuff that's private, that's behind the wall. Someone should not have to worry about that. That's internal to you. Public method headers just means the first line of the method, right? The actual contents of the method should not be of concern to someone using your code. They should not have to ever look at it. Your javadoc comments are useful to someone who's reading, who's trying to figure out how to use your code. That is where they see, you know, what they should provide for the arguments, what the expected return value is, what does the stuff do. All of these things should be in your Javadoc comments. Your regular line comments should be thought of as private comments, right? Like, I know we don't technically distinguish public and private comments, like there's no language construct for it, but it's, it's helpful to think of javadoc comments as being public comments and your inline comments, all other forms of commenting, to be private, content, uh, private comments. Right? Those are for you and anyone else working on that class, like actually in there and programming it. Does that make sense? Um, so. So we do not need a, a Java comment for a, a private, uh, private method? Um, well, you should comment, you should still do commenting for them uh, because, so the question is, what about Javadoc comments as applied to private methods, right? So you should still do the Javadoc commenting, right? because it's useful to you as well, but a private method is for your use only, not for the use of people using your software. So it kind of does, it's, it's not as important that the stuff that they're not supposed to use is commented in a public facing way. <laughs> you know, that's just logical. Um, but you should still just maintain a consistent documentation standard because it's easier to be consistent about things, right? It's just less mental effort if you're, you know, I just comment everything versus, oh, I'm picking and choosing what I'm commenting, right? Um, I'm trying to save your, I'm trying to save your precious neurons. So, the interface, or API, Application Programming Interface, tells the programmer everything they need to know in order to use your class. In theory, if you've written your code poorly, it won't do that. And they will have to dive into your source code, which is not preferred. The whole point of programming in this style is that the class is an abstraction of the code. Think about library methods, right? Consider, for example, a random math library method like, well, random, sure, <laughs> why not? So math.random, right? We know that it returns a random value between zero and I think it's point, uh, 1.0 exclusive, so you don't ever actually get 1.0 out of math.random, but you can get actually 0.0. .0 in theory. Um, we know what it produces as output. We know it requires nothing from us. It just generates a random number. 
It is not necessary for us to know how the random method works, right? It's interesting if you're interested in that sort of thing, but it's not like we don't need to know. And because we don't need to know how it works, we can just use it without thinking about it. There's already enough to think about in this world without having to know how the random function works without, uh, in order to be able to use it. Your code should be written under the same philosophy. When you write a method which forms the interface for the function, number one, the user, the end user of that method should not have to use a bunch of if statements to give good values into it. You know, they are not responsible for guarding your code. You are responsible for guarding your code, right? Uh, the description that you give it in its documentation should be sufficient for someone to use it, right? The, doc, the description of the parameter should, should give enough information that some rando be able to use that function properly, right? This in combination with descriptive argument names. It's kind of a lesser, uh, a lesser item on the, uh, the documentation standards for the course, but like not using like stupid random variable names is also like I, I, I can very justifiably uh, take marks off you if you're, ta if you're using like just bogus random names. In, uh, in your classes. Like, I know I use foo and bar, but you guys are not allowed to use foo and bar, basically. Um, because the variable should do something, it should describe what it does, the variable name is part of the documentation, right? Um, some people talk about self-documenting code. What they mean by that is, the variables and the methods and class names are sufficiently descriptive that you can get a pretty good idea of what it's doing just from those alone, right? But it's always not, it's never enough. Hence, we have javadoc oh, and, ah, as well. Does this make sense? So far, so good? Okay. So, implementation. The implementation is everything that's private plus all of the bodies of all of the methods, plus comments inside the methods, private comments. The programmer who uses your code should not need to know any of that. If they do need to know any of that, um, you're going to hear about it, probably from your boss. So. Two big advantages to this distinction. I've already talked about it a bit. Ease of use. Imagine if you had to understand how Scanner worked. Two, you can change the implementation. So, let's imagine, just for the sake of interest, that you're making a class to hold um, uh, you know, organize a large number of bank account classes, right? Bank account objects. You know, that first, uh, in the list of items, the first one. Let's imagine a super class over that where you've got like, you know, you know, 200,000 bank accounts to manage, right? You write your interface for it, everything's going fine. But, at one point, someone, probably a customer, says, wow, this software is very, very slow. And because it's so slow, I'm thinking of switching to another, to another vendor's software. Um, maybe do better? And your boss is like, we got this bad review. What are you going to do about it? And you're like, well, I guess I'm going to optimize the code then. If you have properly encapsulated your code, you can make modifications under the hood without changing the interface, which, you know, so long as you're not introducing bugs, doesn't modify any, like, none of the code that uses your code needs to be modified, which is good and nice and wonderful, you know. 
If, for example, you were organizing all of your bank accounts into one big linked list, and it's like, well, of course, searching is taking forever because searching over a linked list is highly inefficient. And then you change it so that it's a hash table or some other efficient searching algorithm. And it's like, wow, I have literally a hundred million thousand percent increase in speed because I'm using a proper data structure now. And, it, you know, you get the speed bonus. You work on one class. Nobody else's classes have to change. Modifications you make down, down, down deep in the code base do not need to be propagated up through, up through to the level of the main application. It contains modifications. Does that make sense? This is also known as information hiding. The person using your software should not need to know what kind of data structure you're using to store it. That's not necessary information. They should just know, like, it's got a search function, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at this rectangle class for a moment. In this rectangle class, we have instance variables for width, height, and area. Right? When the set dimension method is called, it requires width and height to be set as parameters, passes those on to the corresponding instance variables, and then it calculates the value of the area and stores it. Make sense? That's what it's doing. So, when we need to get the area out of the rectangle, all we need to do is return area. Bing, bang, boom. Simple, right? Consider the following alternative implementation. When we call set dimension, we set width and height, but area is not modified. You may also notice area is not an instance variable of this class. When we ask for the area, we multiply the width and height values directly and return the result of that. So, Advantages and disadvantages. What are some advantages of the first one? Does anybody have any idea? We are storing the result in a variable. I'm sorry? So we're storing the result in a variable. It's not getting stored in this one. That's true. The result is being stored in a variable. But like, what's the advantage of storing it in a variable? We may need to call it. Sorry? We may need to use it later on. We may, may need to use it later on, it's true, but um, in this case, we could just call get area several times, right? Yes? Uh, the difference between the two are storage and speed. Yes, that's the trade-off, right? So, in the first example, we are pre-calculating the area and storing it, so, Anytime we call get area, that's a faster operation. We don't need to perform the multiplication. We perform it once up front, keep it in, keep it in a variable, and refer to it several times, right? It also depends, though, on how many times get area is called relative to set dimension. If set dimension is called 1,000 times for every time air, get area is called, it doesn't make sense to load set dimension up with that functionality. In that case, this would be the preferred way of going about it. Right? Is, am I making sense? Sort of? A little bit? 
hopefully, just a smidge. Um, so, to, to clarify that, to go over that point one more time, right? So, implementation A, implementation B. Talking about set dimension. Implementation A contains three statements. So it executes three statements times the number of times the method is called. Right? B executes two statements every time the method is called. So with get area, um, it's kind of Let's, let's just say A has like one statement to execute, B has 1.5. Like, what we could, if we wanted to really drill down, we could like pick these parts and see how many operations are involved in each of these in like assembly code, but let's not go that far, <laughs> right? So, you can see A spends longer setting dimension and less time retrieving. B spends less time setting and more time retrieving, right? So if the ratio here, right, set dimension is called 1,000 times to every one time um, get area is called, right? Then in this case, you would have a total runtime of 3,001. And in this case, 2001? 2001.5. Yeah. Right? So which is more efficient? 2000. Right. The B one. But if the situation were reversed and you were asking for the area 1,000 times for every one time you're setting the dimensions, right? Three options. Basically, like, where the advantage is flips, right? So it depends on how frequently the methods are being called as well. Another, so, like basically what we're talking about is uh, design trade-offs, right? One of the, um, this one comes up a lot, one of the fundamental design trade-offs that you will find, um, you can usually trade memory for speed. So this is a process known as caching. In our first example, we pre-calculate the area, cache that value, and retrieve it later. Right? We have that result ready for when it's needed. This has certain advantages, but it takes more memory to do that, right? The more stuff you're caching, the more memory it takes up. You can get very, very good speed improvements using caching, though. Um, a uh, classical example of this is um, Calculating Fibonacci numbers, which is kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a mathematical example, but, you know, this is a quasi-math class. So, you know what the Fibonacci sequence is? Yep. Just yeah. Oh, really? Good. Oh, there you go. A tie-in. Um, so, one, two, one, one, two, three, five, eight, etc. Right? Each element of the Fibonacci sequence is designed, defined as the sum of the two previous values. Right? Yeah, so fib three is equal to fib two plus fib one. This is known as a recursive algorithm. When a function calls itself, that's recursion. All right? So the problem is, under this style of recursion, if you, uh, do you mind if I erase this? Um, 
if you're not caching values, you end up in a situation like this. If I'm calculating fib, if I'm calculating the Fibonacci number of two, I need one and I need zero. Right? One and zero are at base cases. If I'm calculating three, I need two and I need one. If I'm calculating four, I need two, one, and zero. If I'm calculating 5, I have to take this whole tree and duplicate it, right? The number of function calls you need to calculate the Fibonacci sequence is proportional to 2 to the power of n, where that n is the number that you're trying to calculate, right? That's the number of cases you have to calculate. That's a frickin' line. Basically, uh, most machines that I've ever like done the code example on max out around being able to calculate Fib 42. After that, it starts taking 10 minutes to calculate the number. Right? So, how do we fix this with caching? Well, with the example of 5, if you've cached what 3 is, you don't need to recalculate it. Precisely. If, rather than having to recalculate the whole tree each time, when you calc, like, you don't have to calculate 1, because it's a base case, but if you calculate 2 and then save the value to, you know, an array, say, 2 becomes, you know, 2, 0 and 1 are both and you're saving this to an array, right? Then when you go to calculate 3, you've got 1, it's in the array, you've got 2, it's, that's in the array, so you can just proceed and calculate 3, which is um, 3, right? Then when you get to 4, 3 has been saved, 2 has been saved, so you don't have to recalculate the trees, you just look up the values, that's 5, there you go, right? You can see where I'm going with this? If you're saving the values in memory, you vastly, over, you vastly improve the runtime of this algorithm. It's no longer proportional to 2 to the power of n. It is now proportional to n. Right? It takes a number of steps proportional to the number you're trying to calculate. <laughs> so, that's... Like, instead of capping out at like 42, you can now easily calculate things like 42 million. Of course, with the Fibonacci number, like, these Fibonacci numbers become very, very large in themselves, so like, Fib 42 million probably wouldn't fit on a screen. That's how big the number is. So, you know. Whether or not it's useful to calculate that, it's kind of beside the point, but uh, in theory it could be done very, very, very quickly. Does this make sense? So, this is the trade-off. You can spend some memory and get yourself, you can bump, bump yourself into, you know, vast improvements in runtime. But, historically speaking, People didn't often take, like, they would often take the, oh, I'll take the runtime hit. And the reason is, on, yeah, exactly, for scarce resources, on old, old, old main trays, or like Windows 95 machines, or whatever, like, people really take for granted how much memory they have available these days, you know? Like, the, um, that's why long variable names are good, because you don't need to save two bytes by calling it something dumb. Precisely. Back, well, like, like back in the day, you would, you would have like very abbreviated things, because like you were worried about how much text was in the program that needed to be compiled. The, this, um, like this culture in programming persists to this day of like trying to get your code as small as possible. 
like kind of more as like a fun thing now, but back in the day it was so you could fit it on a disc, right? Um, so yeah, like back in back in the old days, um, you know, a, an expensive computer mainframe that would have been the size of this room might have had a couple of kilobytes available, you know, um, and you'd be lucky to have that. Nobody needs more than 640k anyway. Well, I mean, I couldn't possibly imagine what you would do with all of that memory, right? Um, so, you know, these days, memory is cheap. Memory is, like, people lose USB drives with, like, six orders of magnitude more memory than a computer mainframe had in the 1970s, you know? Like, it's, it's just incredible how much memory there is now. So, you know, as a rule, these days, you always take that. You always take, uh, you always spend the memory to get the runtime because you have so much memory. So much memory, right? So fast is good. Fast is much better than slow. And we don't have to carry that. We don't have to worry about memory anymore, basically. Um, does that, does that kind of make sense? I know I kind of went off on a, on a tangent there for a minute, but it's, it's important to me that you don't just learn Java. It's important to me that you learn, you know, I'm trying to get you in the right mind frame for your uh, data structures and algorithms class that's coming up in fourth semester, I think, third or fourth semester. But, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, any questions? Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> anything left to cover? Oh. Um, if any of you were hoping for a list of like useful Java FX. Uh, commands that uh, seemed to be mysteriously absent from last week's material. Um, here you go. Here's a bunch of Java FX commands, as well as other useful sorts of functions. Um, all right. All right. This is like, it is five minutes to the end of class right now, right? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not like having a hallucination? Yeah, no. four o'clock. Yeah, all right. Um, well, in that case, um, I would like- five minutes already? I would like, uh, does anybody have a motion to bring to, does anybody, would anybody like to make a motion to dismiss class? All right, there we go. Do I have a seconder? Okay, good. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed to say nay. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. See you next week, folks. That's Robert's order right there. Yeah. If you're lucky, maybe by the end
uh, using the method. So if I want to print the count one, Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 